It all began in 1971 in Palo Alto, just south of San Francisco, when Xerox, the copier company, set up the Palo Alto Research Center, or PARC. Xerox management had a sinking feeling that if people started reading computer screens instead of paper, Xerox was in trouble. Unless they could dominate the paperless office of the future. You could take uh, computer technology into the office and make the office a much better place to work, more productive, uh, more enjoyable, a lot more enjoyable, um, more interesting, more rewarding. Uh, and so we set to work on it. Bob Taylor ran Park's computer science lab, and one of the first things he did was to buy bean bags for his researchers to sit on and brainstorm. These are a couple of uh, the original bean bag chairs. Uh, the role of the bean bag chair in computer science is ease of use. Okay. It was said that of the top 100 computer researchers in the world, 58 worked at Park. Strange as the staff never exceeded 50. But Taylor gave these nerd geniuses unlimited resources and protected them from commercial pressures. It's very comfortable. Now let's see you get out of it. I feel my, my neural capacity already increasing. There you go. Oh, God. <laughs> the atmosphere at Park was electric. Uh, there was total intellectual freedom. There was no conventional wisdom. Uh, almost every idea was up for challenge and got challenged regularly. The management said, go create the new world. We don't understand it. Here are people who have a lot of ideas and tremendous talent, young, energetic. People came there specifically to work on five-year programs that were their dreams. This is a computer room in the basement of the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center about 25 years ago. They built the Max time-sharing system in here, and now it's loaded with all sorts of other computers. And uh, there's one that we're really interested in here. Let's see. Here it is. Let me, let me turn on the lights. OK. Here we have it. This is a Xerox Alto computer uh, built around 1973. Some people would argue that this is the first personal computer. Uh, it really isn't, because for one thing, it, it wasn't ever for sale. And the parts alone cost about $10,000. But it has all the elements of a, quite a modern personal computer. And without it, we wouldn't have the Macintosh, we wouldn't have Windows, we wouldn't have most of the things we value in computing today. And ironically, none of those things has a Xerox name on it. What's the mail this morning? This promotional film made in the mid-70s to flaunt Xerox Park research shows just how revolutionary the Alto was. It was friendly and intuitive. This is an experimental office system. It's in use now. It had the first GUI using a mouse to point to information on the screen. It was linked to other PCs by a system called Ethernet, the first computer network. And what you saw on the screen was precisely what you got on your laser printer. It was way ahead of its time. Thank you, Fred. Everybody wanted to make a real difference. We really thought we were changing the world and that at the end of this uh, project or the set of projects, personal computing would burst on the scene exactly the way we had envisioned it and take everybody by total surprise. But the brilliant researchers at Park could never persuade Xerox management that their vision was accurate. Head office in New York ignored the revolutionary technologies they owned 3,000 miles away. They just didn't get it. And none of the main body of the company was prepared to accept the answers. So there was a tremendous mismatch between the management and what the researchers were doing in that these guys had never fantasized about what the future of the office was going to be. And when it was presented to them, they had no mechanisms for turning those ideas into real life products. And, and that, was, that was really the frustra frustrating part of it because you were talking to people who didn't understand the vision. And yet the vision was getting created every day within the, the Palo Alto Research Center, and there was no one to receive that vision. But a few miles down the road from Palo Alto was a man ready to share the vision. The most dangerous man in Silicon Valley sits in an office in this building. People love him and hate him, often at the same time. For 10 years, by sheer force of will, 
he made the personal computer industry follow his direction. With this guy, we're not talking about someone driven by the profit motive and a desire for an opulent retirement at the age of 40. No, we're talking holy war. We're talking rivers of blood and fields of dead martyrs to the cause of greater computing. We're talking about a guy who sees the personal computer as his tool for changing the world. We're talking about Steve Jobs. <laughs> I'm Steve Jobs. When I wasn't sure what the word charisma meant, I met Steve Jobs and then I knew. Steve Jobs is on my eternal heroes list. There's nothing he can ever do to get off it. He wanted you to be great. And he wanted you to create something that was great. And he was going to make you do that. He's also uh, obnoxious and uh, this comes from his high standards he has extremely high standards and he has no patience with people who don't either share those standards or perform to them and I'm also one of these people that I, I don't really care about being right you know I just care about success Steve Jobs had co-founded Apple computer in 1976 the first popular personal computer, the Apple II, was a hit and made Steve Jobs one of the biggest names in a brand new industry. At the height of Apple's early success in December 1979, Jobs, then all of 24, had a privileged invitation to visit Xerox Park. And they showed me really uh, three things. But I was so blinded by the first one that I didn't even really see the other two. Uh, one of the things they showed me was object-oriented programming. They showed me that, but I didn't even see that. The other one they showed me was really a networked computer system. They had over 100 Alto computers, all networked, using email, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't even see that. I was so blinded by the first thing they showed me, which was the graphical user interface. I thought it was the best thing I had ever seen in my life. Now, remember, it was very flawed. What we saw was incomplete. They'd done a bunch of things wrong, but we didn't know that at the time. It's still, though, they had the germ of the, of the idea was there, and they'd done it very well. And within, you know, 10 minutes, it was obvious to me that all computers would work like this someday. It was a turning point. Jobs decided this was the way forward for Apple. He came back and I almost said asked, but the truth is demanded that his entire programming team get a demo of the Smalltalk system. And the then head of the Science Center asked me to give the demo because Steve specifically asked for me to give the demo. And I said, no way. I had a big argument with the Xerox executives telling them that they were about to give away the kitchen sink. And um, I said I would only do it if I were ordered to do it, because then, it, of course, would be their responsibility. And that's what they did. The mouse is a pointing device that moves a cursor around the display screen. Adele and her colleagues showed the Apple programmers an Alto machine running a graphical user interface. A selected window displays above other windows, much like placing a piece of paper on top of a stack on a desk. The visitors from Apple saw a computer that was designed to be easy to use, a machine that anybody could operate and find friendly, even the French. I think mostly what we got in that hour and a half uh, was inspiration, and basically just sort of a, a bolstering of our convictions that um, the, a, a more graphical way to do things um, would make the, this business computer more accessible. After an hour looking at demos, they understood our technology and what it meant more than any Xerox executive understood it after years of showing it to them. Basically, they were copier heads that just had no clue about uh, a computer or what it could do. And so they, they just grabbed, uh, grabbed defeat from the greatest victory in the computer industry. Xerox could have owned the entire computer industry today. Um, could have been, you know, a company ten times its size. Could have been IBM. Could have been the IBM of the 90s. Could have been the Microsoft of the 90s. 